Last week I had the opportunity to listen to the story of Jamika McCall. She was speaking to court-appointed special advocates, CASAs. They're volunteers who speak for neglected and abused children in court. It's uh, an organization that uh, trains these volunteers. And part of the training is to understand these stories and the perspectives of, uh, in this case, an adult who had been all of these things, a foster child, uh, an abused child, a foster child, an adoptive child, and Jamika's, uh, Jamika's story is amazing. I wanted to share it with you because I think it's a perspective that even as ordinary citizens is life-changing, and whether you're a parent, a teacher, um, just you take it to work with you and you have an opinion for what other people may have been through, it's, uh, it's really a neat story. So I hope you'll take the time to watch. So I've also been a, um, a foster child. I've been adopted. I've been a caseworker, manager at the CASA program, so I have been in, um, and then I've also been a CASA, so I've been an advocate, and I've also supervised CASAs um, for two years, and now I'm a probation officer. So you can ask questions about any and everything. As a, as a CASA, uh, I have a youth as well. Um, she's actually 26 years old, and when I met my CASA youth, she was, um, living on the streets of San Francisco, homeless and on drugs. And she actually, I'm not for sure what she did, but she ended up in juvenile hall. And um, my executive director asked me if I could take her uh, and be her CASA. And I did not want to take her as my CASA. I did not want her. I said, I have 100 plus CASA youth, and I do not want my own personal because I was supervising the, uh, the advocates, and I didn't want my own um, CASA youth. And, but she asked and pleaded, and I said, okay. And that was the best thing that I could have ever done because I'm thinking I'm going to get in this child's life to help her, and she helped me in so many ways. So to this day, she's um, doing well. She's off of drugs. She's clean. Um, she's working, and she calls me not as often as she used to call me. She calls me, anytime she calls me, she needs a little help with something. And I don't always help her. I ask her what's the plan, because I don't want to set her up to fail. Uh, and I don't want to be in a position where I'm paying rent every month either. So I ask her what's the plan, and I've also, and I've told her no sometimes. Um, and then sometimes I've told her yes. So she's still in my life as we talk lifelong connections. You guys probably know what that is. Um, she's still in my life, and I'll always, um, She'll always be, she will always be in my life. And when I get the calls, I know she probably needs something. She doesn't always call me to say, how you doing? But it's okay. So, um, so I've been a, a CASA advocate. I've supervised CASAs. I've supervised CASAs. I've um, had CASA call, um, CASAs call me and say, I can't believe my youth, she's getting Ds. She's getting Cs. And I'm going, okay, what's the problem? She's getting Cs and she's getting Ds. Okay, well, and I had to explain to them what uh, children that have been abused and neglected, why they're not signing up to get A's and B's and McDonough Row like their children. Most of the CASAs were retired professionals, and their children probably did pretty well, or at least maybe made C's instead of B's, and um, they didn't understand what was going on. And I'm saying at least they're going to school. That's the biggest thing. So, um, so I've been in that position where um, I've had to tell Casas it's okay. I've also had to explain to Casas stay in your lane. You're no longer working as the nurse or the psychologist or the doctor when you were working or working, but you're now the Casas the the youth for the I mean the Casa, and you have to stay in your lane too. So I have experience in that. Uh, adopted, asked me anything about that, and been in the foster care, and of course been abused and neglected by my uh, birth parents. You can ask me anything pertaining to that. Or if you have a story or you just need help with trying to understand why this child that you have is doing X, Y, and Z, you can probably guesstimate why they're doing it. So you know. So um, any questions before we start? Why did you choose to be a probation officer? Um, well, I, I think, although my life started off um, pretty bad, 
and I think law enforcement was involved in my life really early. I don't know. I just always loved order. I've always liked uniform. I always liked discipline. I always liked just, um, just, um, just that that field. So I actually really wanted to be a judge. That was my goal. Um, and then my second um, goal was to be a probation officer or a marriage family therapist. That's what I want to do. The cool thing about probation is I get to do it all. I get to be the judge. I get to be the, uh, or I play judge. And I get to play uh, marriage family th therapist as well. So within that job, I get to do everything. Um, I worked for Valley of the Moon Children's Home, which is our county's um, shelter for abuse and neglected children. And I did that for probably four years. And I got frustrated working in that um, with use um, with social services because I felt that a lot of the counselors and staff, uh, they were like poor, poor baby to the children that were in the shelter. And I and I get that with the seven and the eight and the 10 and the 12, but when we still saying poor, poor baby at 17 and 18, I started having a problem with that because I want our youth to, I wanted our youth to start getting prepared because what I've learned is no one's going to care about your sad story. It is sad that your mommy or your daddy did whatever they did or they're not there for you. But when you turn 18 years old, you can't use that anymore. And a lot of the staff start a lot to excuse behavior that I didn't think they should excuse. You know, We can teach and help them get through what they're going through, but you can't tear up a place and not go to juvenile hall because if you were not in this shelter you would go to jail you know if you did something like that you can't um assault a staff and just because you're in this setting that you don't go to juvenile hall no you want to go so i got real frustrated with that because i wanted these kids to um use what has happened to them to empower them to do better and not just use their story just to try to get through life by selling their story everyone has a story my story is pretty sad but better believe there's someone's story is worse than my story. And I learned that at an early age that too bad it happened, but um, I still want to make something of myself. I always wanted to do something. I didn't always believe that I could be anything in life, but I always wanted to be somebody. I didn't want to be the abused and neglected child, you know. I always wanted to do something. So probation, I love. I love. I could talk. I can talk to you about that for an hour. I love it. I love it. But I do think that something that you said. I'm kind of curious. What What do you think triggered that thought pattern for you in terms of of recognizing that everyone has a sad story or that someone's story is worse <laughs> than yours? Because I mean, I think you know we work with a lot of kids who they do have sad, you know, very sad, and, and yet at some point. They have, you know, you did have to move on if you want to move on. So, yeah. like, what was it? Was it a particular foster placement or someone that came into life or just personally where you got to? Or um, any particular trigger? You no, know, I think that um, I've always been the type that I love stories. I like to find out about people's lives. And so by me doing that, asking questions about lives, I found for myself that, wow, that story is, you know, that story is really bad, you know, and that person got over it or they didn't get over it. Um, and so I just think it was me just talking to other people and hearing their stories. I always say this, if you don't like someone, hear their story. And I bet it may change your mind about that person. Just try it. You know, the person you can't stand at work that's on the copy machine, just getting on your nerves, go talk to them and ask them their story. And I bet it, it, possibly, it possibly can change your, your mind about that person. So not really, I can't think of anything other than me just um, hearing other stories and saying, wow, that they've been through something. Um, yeah. Yes. Would you repeat the question for the... Um, how did I hear about CASA? So I know I was searching for... So funny story. I always wanted to do something in life. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. And I thought I was supposed to work with burn victims. But I can't stand... The, I, it bothers me to see a, someone burn. So I, I was like... So I was going to volunteer at the um, Shriners Hospital. I think it's... I don't know if they have one out here, but in San Francisco they have a Shriner, Shriners Hospital. And they um, is for burn um, victims, and um, 
And so I thought I was supposed to do something like that. And then um, I said, no. And so I was researching, researching, what can I do? What can I do? And I found the organization by, I think, just online, just looking online. And um, um, actually, yeah, just looking online. And, um, and then I um, interned there. I first started off as an intern there. And then about six months later, I was hired as a case manager. And then um, and I stayed working there for two years. And I love this program. Like, you guys do amazing, amazing work. I wish I would have had a CASA when I was going through this system. So, but yeah. I can't really exactly remember, but I just remember looking online, trying to figure it out. And I just think I just contacted. Oh, no. I'm sorry. I lied. I found out about the CASA program because I was at Sonoma State University and I needed to do an internship. And I saw something on the bulletin board about the CASA program. And I was like, bam, this is what I want to do. That's how I started. So I was in school getting credit, I think, for it at the time. Yes? Are you going to answer this question? Why, why do you still want to have a relationship with your parents? Or why do children want to go back home with their parents? Even if they're in a loving, nice foster home, they still mm. want to go back. Is that answer that question? Is that the answer? Yes. Um, because children still love their parents. They do. It's, going, it's really hard to understand it. Um, it, it does not make any sense at all. A parent that abuse or neglect their child and they really want to have a relationship, that's probably the hardest job for you CASAs to understand that they want to have a relationship with their parents. They really do. They still care about them. They still think about them. They still wonder how they're doing. They want to have a relationship with their parents. Kids are the most forgiving people. We are the ones who remember everything. And we don't ever forgive too often. Um, kids forgive really easy. They really forgive easy. So kids want to have a relationship with their parents. It's no doubt about it. And um, and then you have some kids that don't. So it, it, it's both. But most of kids want to have a relationship with their their parents. And they they worry about them. Um, my this is the honest truth. I never thought about my birth father. I really didn't. Um, and that's only because I think um, when I lived in California, when I was living, um, when I moved to California, I saw so many fathers not involved in their children's lives. So I was like, I guess this is, this is fathers not involved in their lives. You know, my mother, um, and you will hear me say mother, and that's my adopted parents. And you hear me say father, that's my adopted parents. My birth father and birth mother is mine. That's what they are. So uh, my, um, so I never really, um, I saw a lot of absent parent uh, fathers, and so I was like, oh, that's no big deal. But I always did wonder about my mother. I always was concerned about her. I always wanted um, the best for her. I always wanted her to. Um, I always was concerned about her. I don't know why. Now my older sister, she was really concerned about her. I. Uh, she was even more concerned than I was, but I was always concerned. I always wanted to know how she was doing, and I was always interested. In but my birth father, not so much. That's just the honest truth. I think someone had a question over here. No. You answered my question. Oh, I did. I already. Okay. Um, so, mm -hmm. what do you remember from the foster child to adopted? Uh, what stands out to you through that process <laughs> that uh, was either uh, good or bad uh, influenced you? Well, I stuck with you. Yeah, my only really re um, I so I believe when um, we moved to California, my mother. I always say this: it only takes one person to believe in you. One person to believe in, in you for you to believe in yourself. And I think that's what I got is that my, I didn't know my mother cared for us and she would do anything and everything for us. And um, I think that helped me want to be something in life, to do better in life. So that's why I believe it's so cool that Casas, you may be that one person in that child's life that turns the corner, it may not be anyone else. So that's why I feel like your job is so important because I only need one person to change it up for someone. I don't remember anything prior to being in foster care. I remember being in several different foster homes and then that's when my memory starts after that. Did that answer it a little bit? Okay. <coughs> Anyone else? How old were you when you went into foster care? Three years old. 
my sister was four, I was actually going to write that, my sister was four years, my older sister was four, I was three, and my little sister Keisha was 18 months old. And then we had a um, two month old brother, two or three month old brother. And were you kept together as a sibling group or were you separate? My sister and I always stayed together and my little brother was placed in a separate home. Shamika, can you um, share the story about your two foster children that you have? Sure. So, <laughs> so, oh, so sorry, let me, Shamika, this is Shamika Williams. Shamika Williams is Mr. <coughs> Wendell Williams, and you'll hear about him when I present my story, my journey. Um, her father saved our lives. Her father saved our lives. And um, after recent... Well, I'll share this real fast. After um, after I found out who he was, I knew a guy saved our lives. I didn't know what his name was. And then after I got all these articles, I found his name and I went on and I searched and searched and searched and looked for him. And I found out that he had died maybe like two or three years, I believe, um, prior. And then I saw that he had um, children, and so I, I saw that he had two daughters, and I reached out to Shamika through Facebook, and we've been in contact. How long ago was it? Uh, still about uh, three, four years ago. No. About three years? I thought longer. Oh, that's My dad has been gone for about five to six years. Okay, months. okay. And so, it, it, I, you know, actually, you contacted me right after you. Okay. And so it's probably so about four to five, four years. Okay. Okay. And so it's I have a longer time, just kind of. <laughs> <laughs> and we, 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 we text and call. This is my first time actually meeting her. This was one of the goals for me coming to Tulsa. Um, this um, <coughs> coming down was to meet her and her mother and um, uh, Mr. Williams' mother her grandmother, Shamika's grandmother. So um, I went and I spent a day with them, um, whatever day, I don't even know, Saturday, I believe. And um, and she has two foster kids that she fosters. And the children was in the room when we were talking about this story and everything. And they had, one had, one had lots of questions. Um, and um, and then Shamika's gonna just tell us what they spoke about. I, I think it's, again, thank you guys for what you do. Uh, as she mentioned, I am Shamika Williams, but also I'm very involved in But also, I'm also the senior director of Welcome to Citizens of Care, which is a children's care for the citizens of San Diego County. So when you think about the context of kids in foster care, you know, I have many kids in foster care over the state. I mean, throughout Oklahoma, we provide treatment services to all kids. But then also, when you think about the two kids that are significant of home, I'm fostered about, I'm very, because I'm fostered about two kids uh, over the past couple of years. And one of the things that she mentioned to that is very significant in all the kids, all the kids that have come from the home is that the desire to connect or to know their bio parents. Kids come and they have a story, but their story is made. They have a story based on what their worker said, stories based on what they remember, the stories based on what their parents if they still have contact. And so throughout most of my kids' life, they're trying to unmake their story. And they're trying to find the truth. But the significance is most kids in school have a mom that they connect with. Mom. And our kids just want to know who their parents are. They want to know uh, who their parents are. Sometimes they've never met their parents, but their parents are a lot. Uh, my friend, Marcia, said this earlier. He said, uh, kids, that is agreeable. That is, it's pretty much forever. I know people, my, my mother-in-law said me too. She's still 72. She's now searching for her body of parents. And so again, loss and that type of grief is in vigorous grief. It's, it's a completely different step. Now, specific to what Jamika said, one of the things that was really significant for me uh, during her visit is she pretty much talked about her story and shared different aspects of her story uh, with us, but then also we were able to share what we knew. Uh, and, and again, it's been a blessing because I've learned so much about her story and then and again, the, the impact that it's had on myself as well as my family. Um, my kids were very attentive in listening to her story. And after the story, uh, one of my kids is, uh, she's in permanent custody of her parents. Her mom no longer has rights, but she has contact with her mom. That's pretty significant for kids that are older in age in my home. I push for that because, again, I need them to know, again, the, the, the scenario around what mom has no illness, the reality is why they're in a safe place, in a safe space, to begin to understand. 
understand that process and process that information with their therapist. But my 11 year old uh, listened to our story and after her story, my, my 11 year old never met anyone that was an adult that had been a foster kid. Never in her life. And for her to visually see the success that she's had was like, oh wow. And she, she, and she learned uh, Monday, I think it was Monday, that uh, she would not be able to move into an office home because they didn't uh, get certified for her. And so she said, well, I guess I'm going to my mate too. I said, well, I guess you are. And she made some comments and then she said, you know, and, I, you know, I, I, I guess Jamika is, is, you know, I can be successful. I, I can make it, I can do this. She kept, she had made a little comment, and, and I thought about that. And as my eight-year-old, nine-year-old, she had all these different questions about, she questioned her dad. But I think for my 11-year-old, anything she's ever known were other foster kids. Foster is their kids. I mean, we don't have foster adults. And so to associate this foster adult and the success she had to see there is a life after managing in this system that's raising our kids, um, there is a possibility. And so I think that it is, there is some significance about people sharing their story as an adult and really talking to kids in a way, uh, you know, I've been through some hurtful, traumatic experiences, but look at me now. And so I don't think kids associate with this. I, I really think that's important. Thank you for sharing that. A lot of kids have been abused and neglected in the foster care system. They're not signing up to be anything other than Sometimes, most of the time, drug addicts, having 20, 30, or I shouldn't say that many kids, but like having four, 10, 20 kids or so, um, uh, they're not on drugs. They're not really setting high goals for themselves. They're just not, you know? Um, if your own mother and father didn't want you, you're not signing up to be anything other than <coughs> just, I don't know, you're, you're, you don't really have any goals. So um, I'm hoping that more people start sharing their stories because it's been healing. It helps you heal, maybe get through it. So, so uh, I'm not ever wanting to push someone to tell their story, but um, I, I just pray that when they get ready that they start sharing their stories, get it out and on paper. It doesn't have to be like this. It could just to tell somebody what's going on with them because they have a lot of pain inside. I know firsthand, so. Okay, well thank you. Any other questions? Dying? Okay. Um, so I'm going to just, um, I'm just going to briefly share this book. I normally uh, share it after, um, after we're done, but for time's sake, I'm not for sure how much time we will have. And I only have one book. So I've never had a baby book ever, of course, you know, I never had a baby book. Um, so I decided I'll make myself a baby book. Um, so I, made, I got this on Amazon. I actually just got this book probably like a couple of months ago. I just had everything like in a folder. I would gather information up and I just had everything in a folder. And then I said, well, hey, that'd be kind of cool if I got me a baby book. And so my baby book is a little different than probably your baby book or your grandchildren's or your children's baby book. Um, my baby book, contains lots of different things. My birth mother wrote me a letter in 2001. This letter is amazing. No responsibility, no accountability. It, it was bad. So probably now she would write a different letter. I'm thinking but that was bad. She sent me pictures and she had other children in her picture and I'm like, hey. It was kind of, it's just, it, it was kind of hurtful back then. I see you with other children and you did what you did to me and now you're with other children. I don't know who these children are, but it was just like, wow. And then um, if there's a, I have so many articles and most of my information that I got about my story was through articles. So I found out Mr. Williams' name, that's how I found out the address, that's how I found out my sister's middle name, um, her birthday, um, 
the day of the incident, what day it happened. I didn't know, I didn't have any of that. And everyone in the family wanted to be quiet. No one wanted to share this, my story with me. So I had to find them out through articles. So these are just many articles. Um, when my birth mother went um, up on parole, um, when my little sister, I'll explain this later, when she died, um, they covered it again. Um, so um, not only Oklahoma covered this story, but this, this story was covered in Indiana, Idaho. It was covered in a lot of states. Um, so, so I have a lot of articles about it, many articles. And how old were you when you started kind of researching yourself? Um, I started about 20 years old. I, I don't, about 20 years old, I, well, sorry. I started researching about 20 years old. From the time that I can remember, I always wanted to know when, what, how. How did all this happen? What? So I, I needed details. And then when I got of age, um, I no longer needed details anymore. Which I'll talk about that. I no longer needed details, but for a long time I needed details. And my birth mother wouldn't give me the details. She was out of prison, and she still would. She would say that she blacked it out of her mind, and she would never give me details. So that's when I started saying, "Well, I'll find the details out myself." And so I started doing this. Um, I have Mr. Wendell Williams' um, obituary that I have in here that I keep, um, and I was able to find out um, that he was a police officer. He was a fire chief fire chief and um, so when he um, saved our lives this is just what he does he's just a man of service so um, as much as I'm grateful but I think it was just it wasn't like this is just what he would do have done if it was me or anyone so I have some court um, documents that I got um, actually my birth father gave me this when I went to visit him for the first time he handed this form this document to me for whatever reason, I'm not for sure why, but he handed it to me, but it was useful throughout the years because it had the case number on it. And um, it has some other information on there as well that I was able to use to, um, to contact agencies for information. This form I have in here because um, many years I would contact, um, I would start this process and then I would stop because I was either frustrated or tired. And then um, I would start back up again. And then I'll get frustrated or tired or something was going on in my own personal life and I was like, oh, I'll put that on a back burner. But it was lots of times where um, I would have to um, write this letter, send this money, do this. I just got tired of just like, have to pay for my story, my information. So sometimes I got frustrated. So the Department of Human Services, the Oklahoma Department of Human Services, I wrote them, they wrote me back telling me how to do the, um, how to, how much money I need to send and how much, um, what documents I would need to fill out. I contacted the um, juvenile court system, the police department, and then these are all the things that I received back from, from different agencies. I, I sent a dollar, oh, they sent it back to me. I think they did send me whatever document I needed and then they sent my dollar check back to me. So I was like, oh, thank you. Um, I wrote my father a letter back in 1998. Um, and I think that must have been the first time I went down to meet him in 1998. And after I left him, I wrote this letter to him. And um, I was pretty much getting on him about it. And I must, I don't know if I, I think I must have sent him. And then I just kept a copy for myself. But I was fussing at him. My 14-year-old daughter wrote this note, this letter to me um, when I was coming the, um, the morning that I left to come down here, and it's pretty much just saying, Mom, don't worry about me. Um, go out there and get closure for yourself. I'll be fine. So I have that. I never had my sister's um, Keisha obituary and my aunt that's back there. Um, she actually gave me my um, sister's obituary. So now I know exactly what day she passed and the day that she was laid to rest. <coughs> So it sounds like some things are like, oh, big deal. These were so, because I never knew those answers. So to get this, I'm like, oh, this, that's great. Some more court documents. And that's it. Um, you guys see the Tulsa world? Most of you see that. That was pretty fun. And then this is a picture that my aunt also gave me um, while I was here. <laughs> only pictures that I have is pictures of only when I was after that I was burned. I don't really have too many pictures of me without the burns. So it's always kind of cool for me to see myself without the burns. So I just added that in um, this time around. 
So this is a book to be around if you want to look at it. Um, a lot of the articles you just can't Google. I had to send and have someone um, get those for me. Okay, so I have to flip this. This I'm gonna show you why I have to flip it. Why I have to turn this whole thing because I wrote it this way. <laughs> and so I'm like, oh, that's not gonna work. So we just have to. I don't think it has that. Okay. So Teamwork. Thank you. Hopefully, I'm just camera going. Okay. So I'm going to start telling you about my journey. Um, there's a few things. If you want to get in contact with me, I wrote my information here. Mind you, I can't give you any advice about CASA, like you know what you can do and what you can't do. But if you have any questions about anything, just general questions, just call me. I'm available. Um, I am associated with the CASA program in Sonoma County and the Sonoma County Probation Department. Those are my agents. Um, so by the age of 16, I was abused, neglected, foster care, adopted in a domestic violence um, relationship. <clears throat> so I put these children do not set high goals in life. Didn't never, I never set a high goal in life um, for a long time. I didn't have any goals. Um, I put Jamaica, but this is your cost of you. This is what they feel. That's, that's what's going on in their head. They may not ever tell you that's going on in their head, but this is what's going on in their head. They're hurt, they're raised, they're alone. Um, they're fragile, they're sad, they're worthless, they, they feel like this inside, hopeless, lost, harmed, afraid, weak, doubtful, unimportant. I never felt important. I never felt important. Um, so yeah. And then I wanted to, um, to share a little bit of, um, so you understand what order I fall in and things like that. So my birth father is Aaron. And my birth mother is Tanya. They have four kids together. Tamika, Jamaica, don't <laughs> say anything about that. And then Keisha Ashley was supposed to be named Shamika, I heard. So it's going to be Tamika, Jamaica, and Shamika. So I'm so glad they didn't do that. And then Aaron. <laughs> because there's too many Mikas. <laughs> Just too much. Like, come on. It was already bad enough when we um, when we lived in, when we you know moved to California and my mom was saying Tamika come down here and do this and Tamika said no she said Jamika I said no she said Tamika she said Jamika she said so we would go back and forth and we did so imagine it was just Jamika would have been three of us oh well, never mind she didn't come with us but um, so yeah so um, I put uh, and so and then my father I mean my birth father had um, my sister Artisha. So she's in between this group. So this is um, the first group of kids. That's what we, and this is the second group of kids because there's so many. And in between the first and the second, we have Patricia. <laughs> the second group of kids is Aaron and um, um, my birth father, and he had Aaron, Bianca, Eric, Courtney, and Cameron with Debbie. Yes, Debbie is their mom. She's actually back there as well. Um, and um, out of, I wanted to show you, so we see that Aaron is the common denominator for all these children here, 10. Um, so seven girls, three boys, all boys either had law enforcement, they all boys had law enforcement contact, meaning probation, jail, or deal with law enforcement, all the boys. And one of the girls had law enforcement contact, and so LEC means law enforcement contact either on probation or jail. Um, and then, of course, you see you have two children who are deceased now. So um, so out of 10 kids, you have, out of 10 kids, five of the children are, had law enforcement contact in some way, somehow, or they're no longer here. You guys probably heard about my little brother's Courtney story here in um, Tulsa, Oklahoma. It was a huge story they covered as well. Um, so I just wanted you to see the makeup of um, the family and why to me this is so important. We have to stop, we have to break the cycle. You know, we have to break the cycle. And so one of the things that I wanted to do while I was here was to interview my birth parents and uh, to introduce, um, interview my birth parents and I did interview them because I wanted to find out about their childhood. 
If I find out about their childhood, it explained my life. So that's, I didn't care to ask, I didn't interview them about what they did to me. I wanted to find out how, how because I don't know this information, tell me about your childhood. So, uh, because it's a repeated cycle, repeated cycle, and someone has to break this. So I'm hoping more of my siblings break this cycle here. Because, yeah. Okay, all right, so I'm gonna go and I'm gonna start my, my journey, my story, that's okay. My 14 year old, she's funny, she said, mom, you should memorize it. I'm like, I, I can't memorize it because um, by me reading it, it helps me not be in the emotions of it at all, so. And I wanted to, um, a disclaimer, I am not a public speaker. I'm just telling my story. Okay, so you're not going to get um, a public speaker here. Okay, so, right, so I just started with, it's just amazing what happens when you stop and you allow God to start. This adventure that I set out to accomplish far exceeded my goal and my dream. For meeting the late Mr. Williams family, to reuniting with my two already favorite aunties, to meeting the nurse who took care of us at Hillcrest Medical Center and the Alexander Burns Center, to finally sharing my journey of abuse and neglect with the Tulsa Casa program. <laughs> this opportunity to tie the bow around my childhood, childhood experience couldn't have not been planned any better by myself or anyone else. This journey has come full circle. Children are being abused and neglected as we speak. A report is made every 10 seconds. That's about 3.6 million referrals to child protection agencies every year. I'm an ambassador for the Sonoma County CASA program, and approximately two years ago, I publicly started sharing my journey with this organization, and now I get to share it with you. I have also recently started sharing my journey of abuse and the process of forgiveness with colleges and churches. I would like, I would have, I would have been speaking tonight at the Sonoma County CASA program for their spring training around the same time today in Santa Rosa. I love bringing awareness to child abuse all year, but having the opportunity to bring awareness in April is my favorite because it's National Child Prevention Month. That's why I'm wearing blue, because that's what that is. So I'm going to start off presenting my journey of abuse and neglect the same way this evening as I would start off there. So 20 years ago, I started working on this baby memory book. This book contains personal letters, many documents that I've requested from different agencies, such as the police department and the fire department, adoption agencies, and many others. Also included in this book are articles that were published in, a di that were published in different states pertaining to this incident that you're welcome to view later. I've earned two certificates in administration of justice from Santa Rosa Junior College. I've completed internships at Valley of the Moon Children's Home, the County of Marin Juvenile Probation Department, and the Court Appointed Special Advocate Program. And as a non-affiliated independent student, I completed probation officer court training. I shared this resume to explain what this foster child felt she needed to do to be seen, accepted, and approved. See, I earned the certificates because I wanted to make something of my life, but I didn't feel that I was capable of becoming a college graduate. The internships were completed because I needed the agencies to see my work ethics before I allowed myself to be hired. The probation office of court training, well, it was accomplished even before I applied to any agency and after years of counseling, healing, and forgiveness because the little girl inside still questioned who and why would anyone want to take a chance with me when my own mother didn't want me. It seems that I've always needed to show the world that I was a good person and that I was deserving. I'm blessed to share my journey in the hopes that my story will not only help victims, but their perpetrators, with the overall goal of more survivors, more empathy, more compassion, more love, and more kindness in the world. I'm here to share a glimpse of my childhood experience with the hope to explain the life of a foster child's journey of abuse, neglect, and domestic violence from being a victim to becoming a survivor. I 
I'm a, I am a victim of abuse and neglect by my birth parents. My, mother, my birth mother doused our family vehicle with rubbing alcohol while my older and younger sisters and I sat in the back seat. She then lit and threw a match while she watched the vehicle engulf in flames as she held my three-month-old brother in her arms. My older sister fought the flames and the smoke as she tried to open the door. However, she fell unconscious. As the fire grew, my birth mother began to scream for help after she realized the severity of the fire. Wendell Williams, our neighbor who lived across the street, heard her scream and he ran to help. He tried to break the window with his bare hand, but he was unable. So he ran to his garage, got a hammer, broke the window, and pulled myself and my little sister Keisha from the burning vehicle. Our birth mother continued to scream while telling Mr. Williams that her eldest daughter, who was four years old, was still in the vehicle. So he risked his life for the third time and he rescued her just before the emergency personnel arrived on the scene. Our birth mother initially denied any involvement, but a few weeks later she confessed that she set the fire to get even at our birth father. Our birth father was in and out of prisons and drug treatment programs. He did not want the responsibility of raising his own children, so he allowed the state of Oklahoma to place us in foster care. My little brother was in a foster home who was interested in adopting him. On the other hand, when my sister and I recovered enough to be discharged from the hospital, we went directly into foster care, where we would eventually experience several different foster homes. Unfortunately, my little sister Keisha never recovered from the complications of the fire, and she died in the hospital a year later. Additionally, we suffered abuse while in the custody of the Department of Human Services. In one foster home, we were placed in a dark room filled with cats after they knew my sister was terrified of cats. And in another home, our foster mother served her children different meals for dinner, while my sister and I sat at that same dinner table and ate beans every night. A few years later, our great aunt and uncle adopted all three of us, and we moved to California. I was not aware this was my last home and my last mom. I am very appreciative and thankful to my late parents for opening their home to us, whom too required intensive medical treatment and many other services. Although they provided the best care, financial support, and love as they knew best, they verbally, ver they verbally and, uh, and emotionally abused us. Our mother often reminded us when we misbehaved that she did not have to adopt us, and how there were so many other children who loved to be in our place. And, how the, and the only reason why her friends and other relatives were doing anything for us was because of her. My father was a hard worker and he provided for us financially, but nothing more. In my eyes, it was very clear that he did not sign up for this project. I later got involved in a physical, abusive, and unhealthy relationship with an older man, and I had a baby at age 16. I was seeking love in the wrong places. I just wanted to be loved and to love. I just wanted to love and to be loved by someone. I don't trust you, I don't trust God, I don't trust the world, I don't trust life, and more importantly, I don't trust myself. Why do you care or want to be involved in my life? Sorry, why do you care or want to involve yourself with me? My own mother and father didn't want me. Why do you want me to get good grades and go to school? I'm not going to be anything in life. Why do you care if I do drugs? I'm worthless. Why would I respect my body? I don't love myself. Why would I hold my head high? I'm not special to anyone. Why would I smile? I'm angry. Why would I have self-esteem, self-worth, self-confidence? Unfortunately, children who have been abused and neglected may never introduce themselves like this to you. You may never know these important aspects of their lives to understand their walk and their talk, why they blow their placements, why they don't trust you, why they are ready to pack up and flee if they sense the slightest negativity or danger, or why they stay in unhealthy relationships and situations, or why they, were all, why they will always test the world. You may never know how the trauma in their lives has affected them or how they are reminded daily of their reality by, by things that are normal or not a big deal to you, how they feel and felt, and why their stressors and triggers are so much higher than the average person. These children just want to be validated, reassured, and witnessed by someone who cares. Most of these children have never had anyone say to them, I'm sorry your life started off like this. I'm sorry your parents failed you. I'm sorry your um, parents didn't protect you. Or simply, you did not deserve to be abandoned, abused, or neglected. My goal in life after I became a teenage mother was just to graduate from high school, so my family couldn't say I told you so. 
and to show the world and show society that I could at least graduate from high school. I then decided I would rely on my best friend who was smart to help my daughter and I get through the rest of our lives. Well, I'm proud to say that I've earned my Bachelor's of Arts degree in Sociology from Sonoma State University. I've worked for the Sonoma County Court Appointed Special Advocates as a case manager and have supported and trained advocates to work with abused and neglected children. I've also worked at the Valley of the Moon Children Home, the shelter for abused, abandoned, and neglected children as a resident care counselor, and now as a deputy probation officer for the County of Sonoma, currently assigned to the Juvenile Investigation <coughs> So the question I often get asked is, how did you go from the burning vehicle to the hospital stay to foster care, being adopted, involved in a long-term abusive relationship, and, any to, and, and everything in between that to standing here today? I'll tell you. At age 16, after giving birth, I was laying in the hospital bed, talking on the phone, drinking orange juice, and holding my beautiful newborn. I accidentally spilled orange juice on the top of her head. I began to cry and thought I was going to be the worst mother in the world because who spills orange juice on their newborn? <coughs> a few minutes later, it clicked. If I could make a big mistake like spilling orange juice on my, new, on my daughter's head, then my birth mother could too. I know the comparison of fire and orange juice is silly, but I was 16 years old and it worked. That was the beginning of my healing process. I eventually forg forgave my Sorry. I eventually forgave my birth mother, and since then I've been able to find my purpose in life. I learned that forgiveness takes one person, and you don't need the consent of the other person, their buy-in, participation, approval, or even their help. I learned that my situation didn't happen to me, but it happened for me. I also stopped asking why me, it was no longer an interest of mine, and started asking why not. Because if it wasn't me, then who? I also discovered it only took one person to believe in me to help me believe in me. This is how my life started, my story. However, my story does not define me, it's just my story. Good evening. Let me reintroduce myself to you. I am Jamika McCall. I'm a survivor. These burns on my face are my survival marks and I wear them proudly. I don't tolerate, accept, or accommodate inappropriate behaviors from anyone. I am confident, I know my self-worth, my self-esteem is high, and I love, love, love beings. <laughs> Except for lima beings. I hold my head high so the crown doesn't slip, and most importantly, I've learned to love and trust God, myself, others, and life. Lastly, each time I'm blessed to share my journey, my story, I get to honor my little sister, Keisha, by saying her name. She's the only child that I've mentioned by name in here. I don't mention any other sibling by name in here. So I get to honor my sister, Keisha, by saying her name. I don't know how she looked, but I know her name. I get to honor my older sister, my hero, although to this day she's still the four-year-old girl who holds herself responsible for not opening that door. I get to honor and say thank you to the family of my angel, the late Mr. Williams, for risking his life not once, not twice, but three times to save three little girls. I get to honor, I get to honor God and apologize for being angry with him after I prayed for a miracle to remove the burns from my face and the pain from my heart. I now know this had to happen to me in order for me to know my purpose in life. So please report any suspected abuse or neglect to your local child for um, protection services. Thank you for allowing me to share my journey with you, but more importantly for working for an awesome organization and becoming a CASA. Thank you. So that's my story. That's it. I, um, I have a lot of things that happen in between that, but that's the big part of the story.